Intel's very first Pentium ran at only 60 MHz and it was flawed. It had a floating point division bug causing quite negative press at the time. But despite all of this, the name Pentium became a huge success. I will talk a little bit about the history of the Pentium 60. We will check out the test system. I got a little bit sidetracked, so we will also compare ISA against Vesa local bus performance. The cache chips are upgradable, so we will increase the cache and see what the differences are. I will also touch on BIOS tweaking to get some performance, some extra performance out of this machine. And finally, we will check out benchmarks and some classic games. And in the end, is this a system worth getting as a retro gaming PC? Big thank you to Mike from Canada. He sent the system to the channel as a donation. Thank you very much, greatly appreciate it. Before the Pentium, Intel's processors had numbers like a 286, 386 and 486, but they couldn't trademark number-based product naming conventions. So competitors could also call their products a 486. Intel, of course, wasn't happy with that. So for the fifth generation of processors, they called it the Pentium. This Pentium 60 has the famous FDIV bug. It's a floating point division error showing up in very rare situations. But after a while, the public pressure was so great. At first, Intel downplayed the significance, but eventually they caved in and offered product replacements. The Pentium ran at a clock speed very comparable to a 486, but performance was greatly improved. And this is because it had a superscalar design, but also a dual pipeline system. And in short, what that means is that the Pentium CPU can execute multiple instructions at the same time. Let's have a look at the main board. This is a beautiful one. We have chipsets from Opti, model numbers C596 and 597. Here we have the model number from the main board, PB5500C-256K. That means it came with 256 kilobytes of level two cache. But if you look carefully here, there's a little table. It goes all the way up to one megabyte and I've done that upgrade. So later we will compare the performance. CPU goes here. We have two vessel local bus, ISA and PCI all on one board, which is fantastic. I've upgraded the RAM. It came with 70 nanosecond uh, RAM and now we're having 60 nanoseconds. That allowed me to run the memory timings at the fastest settings. And one modification I did, it did come with a battery. It wasn't leaking or anything like that, but I removed batteries from these old boards. They can leak and take the board into the grave. And here we have the processor. Now, I didn't even try to remove that CPU cooler because it's really glued tightly onto the CPU. If you know a method for removing it, let me know, but I'm actually not sure if I want to. It seemed to do a really good job at cooling the CPU. Came with a little adapter, so you connect this into the Molex of your power supply and off you go. For the graphics, I test usually at first with an ISA video card to make sure everything is working. And in case something explodes, then I haven't lost a precious video card. This one has a chip from Cirrus Logic. The GD5422 has worked really well for me in many projects, but don't use such a card with a Pentium 60. You will lose a lot of performance. I have benchmarks coming up later. You wanna use something like this for the Vesa local bus. This is from Diamond Multimedia. We have the model number here, Stealth 64. And this is a really fast video card. We have a chip from S3, the Trio 64. This is one of the fastest video cards for the Vesa local bus. This is the storage controller that ended up working really well. We have a chip here, a Gold Star Prime 2. I really like these and we have a single ID interface here, floppy controller goes there. We have two ports for serial devices. This one has a game port and here is the parallel port. For storage, I'm using a SD card. So we have this adapter. ID goes to the ID storage controller, plug in power and here we have an SD card. It's a eight gigabyte 
model. And of course, as always, we use the good old GoTech floppy USB emulator that was necessary to boot up from MS-DOS 6.2.2 and then partition and format the SD card. After that, it's real easy. You shut down the machine, eject the SD card, plug this in into a USB uh, card reader, and then I can copy benchmarks, files, games across really easily. We need various adapters, for example, for the keyboard, we need one that goes from the larger DIN to the smaller one. And we also need an adapter for power. So here goes a modern ATX power supply. And on the other end, the AT connectors. Make sure that the black wires are together when you plug this into the main board. To start the project, I set everything up and I need to see it working. So here we have everything connected with the ATX to AT adapter, keyboard adapter, the ID to SD card and also the GoTech USB floppy emulator. And yeah, initially the first storage controller wouldn't work. So I swapped that out and after that the machine posts and we are off to the races. The SD card gets auto detected in the BIOS, but to make life simple, I choose one of the pre-set hard drive configurations. There's one with 504 megabytes, which is perfect for MS-DOS. Let's have a look at some benchmarks. This is with the ISA Cirrus Logic video card and yeah, we're getting quite slow numbers. This is not much better than our entry level 486. Even in the 3D benchmark, only 23.9 FPS. We can see much more solid performance once we install the VLB, the VESA Local Bus video card. 3D bench now, yeah, the performance, yeah, more than double, 49.6 FPS. Across the board, you want to have a VESA local bus. Only in the PC player benchmark and in Quake, here we are more limited by the CPU than the video card. In the BIOS, we can tweak the performance a little bit. If we go into the chipset features setup, we can see here all these numbers, these are weight states. Basically what it means is the computer is too fast for the memory and for the cache chips to handle that speed. So weight states are introduced. That basically means the memory will wait a certain number of clock cycles and you can just dial in the lowest numbers possible. Hope for the best. If that works, your memory has enough performance, then you will get a slight performance boost. Here we have the performance after tuning the BIOS and across the board, the performance increases. It's not a huge difference. So don't feel like you're missing out on a lot, but if you want the, the best performance, it's definitely worth visiting the BIOS. And now let's increase the level two cache. You physically have to remove the cache chips and install different ones. So here we have in this slide, I've upgraded the cache to 512 kilobytes. So I doubled it and across the board, we're now getting even higher scores. For example, in 3D Bench, we're now getting 52.4. What about maxing out the level two cache to one megabyte? Here we see the results and we can see in most benchmarks we are getting better performance, but in two tests in 3D Bench and Chris's 3D Benchmark, the performance actually goes down a little bit. So this just shows you, you need to really test. Every chipset has different implementations and the one megabyte cache setting does not always give you the best performance. Slow is good, you can go into the BIOS or run software like setmul to disable the CPU cache. And then we get a 3D Bench score of 16.1. That's on the level of a fast 386 computer. You can play around a little bit with the memory timings and get that number even lower. But that means a lot of speed sensitive games will work perfectly fine on this computer. In terms of working with the machine, I didn't have too many issues. The Storage controller, the first one I tried, the machine wouldn't work, so I swapped it out and that fixed the issue. After that, didn't have any issues at all. And now let's check out some classic games. The first one is Comanche Maximum Overkill from Nova Logic. And I remember when this game came out, I believe I had a 386 even. And of course that machine struggled with this game. The highlight are really the 
voxel graphics you get amazingly detailed uh, terrain mountains and valleys but without those polygons like in most other flight simulator games the game initially it defaulted to medium details and it runs yeah silky smooth i went into the options and selected the high details and we can see that the speed does go down a little bit but it still seems to be running really smooth I'm not sure why the pilot is using night vision goggles during the day. I guess they just didn't have the time to worry about such details. And yeah, all in all, I think this game is a really good fit for the Pentium 60. It would probably be too slow to run on a 486. However, maybe a 486 running at 100 or 133 megahertz can handle this game. I'm not sure, but it's definitely worth checking out. System Shock, what a great game. So this runs really well. If you had a Pentium 60 back in the day, I think you would have a blast playing this game. Be sure to skip the floppy disk version and go for the CD version because that one has speech and it adds so much atmosphere to the game. Now the CD version also supports 640 by 480 resolution. I don't have a capture of that, but the performance is it, just not good enough. Even a higher clocked Pentium is struggling. You, you might want to have a Pentium 2 or maybe a Pentium uh, MMX 233 or something like that. But at 320 by 200, the game is silky smooth and definitely playing first System Shock, it's well worth checking out. Another classic 3D game is Duke Nukem 3D. Here we have it running at 320 by 200, silky smooth, Runs great, no issues playing this game. I also tried the 640x480 option and despite having a Pentium and a Vesa Loco Bus video card, the frame rate is, yeah, it's quite a bit slower. I wouldn't say it's, un it's unplayable, but it's not the resolution and the game I would pick for this machine. If you wanna play Duke Nukem, stick with 320x200. And this is Magic Carpet. This is an interesting game. To be honest, I have no idea what you're supposed to do. Well, I'm to blame. I didn't have much time for this video. In fact, the captures are from over a year ago. It's before I moved to this new town. So at the time, I just quickly tested a few games. Whereas now, if my in my new videos, I wanna, I'm spending more time playing the game, researching, reading the instructions. But for this one, I just didn't have the time. It seems to be running really well. I'm not quite sure how this would have performed on a 486. Maybe a DX266 or a DX4100 can also run it well, but it's definitely doing a good job at running this game smoothly. Still don't know what to do. If you know, let me know what are you supposed to do in Magic Carpet. So let's summarize the video and I share what I think about it. For retro gaming, there's a lot to like. In terms of performance, 3D games at 320 by 200. I think this is a real strength of this machine. And by disabling the CPU cache, you can slow it down to a 386. So that means a wide range of DOS games are perfectly playable on this computer, but stay away from 640 by 480. You wanna have a socket seven machine or higher for that. This system is AT based, which means it fits into retro cases. And that's something a lot of you out there after. So if you're looking for a high performance machine that fits into a classic AT case, yeah, this could be the system for you. On the flip side, you need a lot of adapters to connect with more modern devices. For example, we need an adapter for the keyboard, we need an adapter for the power supply to con convert between AT and ATX. The BIOS is a little bit on the old side, so it doesn't support large storage devices. There are workarounds, you can use disk uh, overlay software and the storage controller is not integrated so you need a dedicated uh, storage controller card and you can't use a PS2 mouse so yeah that's the price of using vintage hardware. The machine was very stable and easy to work with go into the BIOS load the setup defaults and off you go if you want some more performance yeah spend some time tweaking the BIOS settings. So it was really, really easy to work with compared to some of the uh, 486 boards. That can be a nightmare if you want a challenge, 
by a 486 board that supports a multitude of CPUs. You'll have so many jumpers and without a manual, you will be definitely struggling. So to answer the big question, is this something I can recommend for retro PC gaming? Absolutely. In terms of performance and suitability, compatibility, I mean, you get ISA slots, PCI and VESA local bus. There is so much you can do with such a machine. The, the big issue is pricing, of course, because this is the very first Pentium. It holds a high uh, significant place in history and that means collectors are after it and that means prices will likely be on the high side. If you want even more flexibility, I still think the Socket 7 platform is the best because you can sort of cover what the Pentium 60 does. You can also slow it down and it has even more performance to play games at 640 by 480 and you might even have an easier time hunting down a Socket 7 system compared to an early Pentium. But that's just my opinion. What do you think? What is your opinion about the Pentium 60 and how does it compare to a decked out 486? Please share your experiences. I always learn from you. I love reading your comments. And if you enjoyed this video, I certainly had a blast producing it and putting it all together and sharing it with you. Um, please subscribe to the channel. Also check out the video description down below. I will put links, uh, resources in there. For example, the DOS benchmark pack and the DOS starter pack, just to help you out if you wanna set up DOS and you're not quite sure what to do, I try to make it easier for you. And that's it. Thumbs up for the Pentium 60 and I shall see you soon with another one.